Hi, this is Dan Benardot. Today I'll go over a slide set for uh, the class. It's called the Nutrients. You've got it, uh, the handout for this, uh, on your desire to learn. And uh, please take a look at it while I'm going through the the hand through the handout myself. I think it'll be a little bit clear for you. So first, let's just talk a little bit about the basic rules of nutrition. It's very important to eat a wide variety of foods because no single food has all of the nutrients in it in the right proportions that a human needs to stay healthy. Plus, some foods have potentially toxic substances in them that, if you ate a lot of it, could potentially be damaging to you. So eating a wide variety of foods actually takes care of both issues. That is, it exposes your tissues to all of the nutrients you need, and you're assured of not getting exposure excessively of something which may be potentially toxic. Another way to think about this also is that more than enough is not better than enough. A lot of people get themselves in trouble because they think that certain foods are perfect foods and that it's very good to eat a lot of them uh, because this particular food is good for you and there's nothing bad. But you've got to be careful because there's no such thing as a perfect food. So eating the right amount of it is good, but more than that is not healthful. That's particularly a problem when people think about vitamins and minerals. They think there's no upper end to the right amount of vitamin or mineral that they can take, but every single vitamin or mineral has a potentially unsafe level, which if you exceed that can be more damaging than helpful. So you have to be careful. More than enough is not better than enough. Uh, people need to find out what works for them and make sure they don't overdo it. Another basic rule of nutrition is that exposure to all nutrients in all six major nutrient classes is critical. You can't leave anything out. Some people have heard that fats are bad for them, so they try to avoid fats altogether, but fats have many useful things, including the essential fatty acid, that without which a lot of problems would occur, neurological problems in particular. So uh, exposure to all nutrients in all six major nutrient classes is very important. You've probably seen these nutrients before or heard of them. Protein, vitamin A, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, vitamin C, calcium, and iron. One of the goals for you in this class, I think, is to make sure that you become conversant in how to discuss these nutrients. And it's important to consider that these nutrients, many of them, have multiple names. So vitamin A, for instance, is retinol. Thiamine is vitamin B1, and so on. So it's very important to think about the alternative names for nutrients so that if you're reading a label and it lists a nutrient as vitamin B1, you know it's thiamine, and you know that it's the same nutrient. Or vitamin B2, you'll know that it's riboflavin. Or vitamin B6 actually has three chemicals which have the same level of functionality, pyridoxine, pyridoxal, or pyridoxamine. And vitamin B12 is called cobalamin. It's an interesting vitamin. It's the only vitamin that contains the, the mineral cobalt, so that's the basis for its name. And vitamin A, the active form, is an alcohol called retinol. You can always tell an alcohol because of the OL ending. But we can make retinol if we have its precursor, which is called beta-carotene. They're quite different, though, because if you want retinol, then you have to eat animal products to get it, something like an egg yolk. Uh, but you can get beta-carotene from all yellow, orange, red, or dark green uh, colored fruits and vegetables, beta-carotene. And we can convert it to retinol, which is vitamin A. And vitamin C, of course, is ascorbic acid. Acids are sometimes abbreviated as ATE, so ascorbic acid and ascorbate are the same. And vitamin E, the most active form, is alpha tocopherol. You'll notice in the dietary reference intakes, which we'll t discuss shortly, that alpha tocopherol is the most active form, but there is a thing called beta tocopherol, gamma tocopherol, and so on. So what they do is they try to calculate what's the alpha tocopherol equivalent. And that's actually how you determine what 
vitamin E content is in a particular food by looking at the alpha tocopherol equivalents or the sum total of alpha tocopherol, beta tocopherol, gamma tocopherol, and so on. So there are quite a lot of nutrition guidelines. Uh, the classic one that we've been using for some time is called the Recommended Dietary Allowances, or the RDA. We'll talk about this in a second a little bit more. And there's a recommended dietary allowance for energy, for protein, for most vitamins, and for most minerals. There's also a thing called the ESAI, the Estimated Safe and Adequate Intake. And uh, we don't quite know what the requirement is for these nutrients, but we know that if you eat that particular amount, uh, that's in the estimated safe and adequate intake that you'll do well. That is, that's considered to be a healthful range. And we also know that there are estimated minimum requirements for sodium, potassium, and chloride, these very important electrolytes. It's also really important to know that there are upper ranges for these things. That is, having more than the safe range is exactly what it sounds like. It's unsafe to consume. The most recent guide is called the Dietary Reference Intakes, or the DRI. If you look at the cover of your book, you'll see that you have a table of the Dietary Reference Intakes in your book. So look at that table and study it. Look at how the nutrient requirements change with age, and look at how the nutrient requirements change with pregnancy and lactation. I think you'll find it interesting because at different ages and different phases of life, uh, the requirements for particular nutrients are altered. There are lots of nutrition guidelines as well. You may notice that on uh, packaging, on food labels, you'll see a percent of the US RDA. Well, what the percent of the US RDA is, is actually the percent of the highest requirement for any group of any nutrient. So the US RDA is the basis for which you can look at it and say, okay, if I, if I have 10% of a nutrient uh, by having one serving of this from this food and 20% from that food, and I eat five times during the day, then I'll get 100% of what I, what I need. In theory, chances are you're going to get a lot more than what you need because you're getting the highest requirement plus the RDA itself, it says, is set at two standard deviations above the requirement, the actual average requirement. So it's kind of an interesting high level to make sure that everybody, if they eat the RDA or the DRI, gets enough. And there are all kinds of other nutrition guidelines out there. There's one for Canadians. The Food and Agriculture Organization has one. The World Health Organization has one. Uh, there are, are nutrition recommendations for Canadians. There's a cholesterol education program that has certain guidelines. There are dietary guidelines for cancer prevention. There's a certain general's report on nutrition and health that has guidelines. There are dietary guidelines for Americans. All kinds of, of recommenda recommendations, but they basically tell you the same thing. They say, you know, if you want to be healthy, eat a wide variety of food. Try to maintain a healthy weight. Choose a diet that's relatively low in fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. Have plenty of vegetables, fruits, and grain products. This is kind of interesting because if you look at those foods which are most associated with cancer, it looks like eating vegetables and fresh fruits is most associated with low risk of cancer. Eating lots of red meat, on the other hand, is associated with high risk of cancer. Use sugars in moderation. Use salt and sodium in moderation, but for physical activity, you have to know that the requirement for sodium is actually equal to what the person may lose in sweat. So if somebody's sweating a lot uh, because the physical activity takes place on a hot and humid day, and they lose a lot of fluid and a lot of salt in the process, then the requirement for sodium can be quite high. And if you drink alcoholic beverages, to do so in moderation. Um, so we have all of these dietary uh, reference intakes, which include, included in them are the recommended dietary allowances, the adequate intakes, the tolerable upper levels, and the estimated average requirements. And together, those constitute what we now have, which is the dietary reference intakes, which are 
in your book. Let's look at the recommended dietary allowances and how they look at them. A lot of people think that if the requirement, let's say, for vitamin C is 60 milligrams, then if you have less than that 60 milligrams during a day, that's dangerous. You could get in trouble. But any amount above that, they think, wow, that's great. That's safe. Not only is it great, but it's probably better for you. Really, an accurate view would be that, you know, there's a, a margin there that you can do quite well with and everything's okay. Uh, you get way too low and you could have a danger of deficiency if, if you stay way low day after day after day. But, you know, if you also get way too high, you can also have a big problem. So, too high or too low is problematic. There is a safe range. And just remember that if you don't have something today, it won't kill you. That your body actually has a backup system for all nutrients. Uh, and you'll do just fine. It's just that if you vary your diet, if you didn't have it today, chances are you'll have it tomorrow. So you'll be fine. If you look at the individual nutrient requirements, um, you know, this is the way it looks for people. There's a standard deviation of requirement. And some people need this amount where the A is, some people need this amount where the B is, and another person may need this amount. Well, the, the recommendations are based on the average requirement plus two standard deviations, which is out here, so that virtually everybody will get the required amount. So here's the recommended intake, and this is the population. So if you eat the recommended intake, it's a rare exception that won't be getting enough nutrient. What's interesting is that most people consider the recommended intake for a nutrient to be a minimum requirement, but it's not. It's actually two standard deviations above the average requirement, and half the population is below the average, and the other half is above the average. So um, eating the recommended intake is probably more than enough of what people actually need. And if you look at the requirement for energy, that is the mean of the requirement, but the requirement for energy doesn't have a lot of meaning because everybody has a slightly different energy requirement based on the kind of activities that they do. And we'll talk more about that uh, later. So, you know, there are also uh, guides that help people understand how much to eat. The food guide pyramid was an earlier one. Uh, right now, that's been changed to what's called MyPlate. So if you go to MyPlate.gov, you can read about how people should be eating. This is kind of interesting because if you look at what should fill your plate, protein is a small portion of it. But just think about what happens if you go out and eat and you order chicken or fish or a steak. Protein takes up half the plate. So look at this because from a distribution standpoint, we tend to overdo it on protein, we tend to overdo it on refined grains, and you really think, uh, I think you need to think about how to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and fresh fruits. Uh, there are specific uh, recommendations for different populations, which are also kind of interesting, and you can look through these because they'll give you some kind of interesting guidance. There's even a soul food pyramid, which takes uh, food preferences uh, in mind. So in the next video, I'll, I'll pick it up here at vegetarianism. Thanks.